Built by tectonics, shaped by waves, our evolving coastline seats Washington's communities most at risk of a large tsunami, which, under worse scenarios, could rise water heights here up to three stories. So here in Sandpoint, in this machine shop, something has been developed to keep us safe. So this is our dart buoy. This is our dart buoy. This is our fourth generation dart buoy. DART, or Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunamis, a team of 50 strategically placed ocean buoys can relay the signal of a wave as small as one centimeter passing over a sensor 6,000 meters underwater. It's sitting on the bottom of the ocean. And it's just been upgraded here at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory to now differentiate between seismic waves and tsunami waves, so it can be placed placed closer to the triggering zone, the Cascadia subduction zone. And that allows us to detect the tsunami 10 to 15 minutes earlier than we could with previous generations. That extra lead time is critical as a tsunami could arrive on the coast in as little as 15 to 30 minutes. It's turbulent flow washing sand ashore and into normally quiet tidal marshes. One site in particular that has more tsunami deposits than anywhere else in Washington, and that site is right here at Discovery Bay. For 25 years, Carrie Garrison Laney has been digging literally into those deposits. This is a core of the top meters, three feet. As you go down section here, you're going back in time. She logs soil cores of marsh peat layers. This one here is from 1700. With radiocarbon dating, a tsunami record back thousands of years, providing clues how often these earthquakes occur. Meanwhile, upgrades to high resolution wave models. We can compute really fast and get an estimate of the inundation, wave elevation, duration of the event, number of waves, pretty accurate forecast in a matter of a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes may be all we get if the next tsunami is triggered nearby. A 4.1 magnitude earthquake in Tennessee woke families up and rattled homes as far away as Atlanta. Now, those tremors spreading across much of the south. We want to get straight to our Alex Boucher with a look at more from reaction from that region. Alex. Hey, Phil. Yeah, so uh, this tremor hit around, or this earthquake hit around 9 this morning uh, in Greenback, Tennessee. That's uh, just outside of of, of Knoxville. And, and and look, I mean, we're, we're used to covering these types of uh, earthquakes and, and you, you see them in, in, in situated areas. Well, this is the Great Smoky Mountains. And so you just saw that bear right there who was curiously kind of approaching a cabin. And then that earthquake hit and, you know, that black bear goes scampering away. We've also seen, uh, that was in Ware's Valley. We've also seen images uh, of, 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 of a dog or excuse me, a cat that was, was scared off a porch as, as this rattling happens. But uh, Phil, one of the things that we're hearing from seismologists is that while certainly in the US there's a huge focus of earthquakes on the West Coast, there is quite a bit of seismic activity uh, in Tennessee uh, in Northern Georgia. This particular earthquake was felt uh, in Tennessee and across six other states uh, at a 4.1, uh, but uh, they, they say that it's along an area or stretch uh, that, that, that's one of the most active in, in the eastern half of the United States. Wow, yeah, and we're just seeing the, some video of it there. Um, and yeah, you can see why there is this fascination. And you mentioned their, their numbers, uh, population numbers are probably pretty strong. Look, we've really got no idea. They're, they're in a part of the world where really no one fishes. They're mid-water in the open ocean. You know, no one's sort of trawling that kind of habitat. No one's diving or swimming. So we really don't know. You know, we've got really we all we know is from the you know what what washes ashore, and there's not a lot of that. But so when they do wash ashore, they're you know very very special. And as far as I know, there's only been a couple of occasions in 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 decades really where they've been seen uh, in in Tasmania. So this is really fantastic. Yeah, and when you say midwater, what is that a depth you're talking about there? Yeah, so they sort of live usually from about 200 metres deep down to about 1,000 metres deep. So out in deep water in, in the open ocean. Um, so it's the kind of water you don't get till you move, you know, 40 odd kilometres offshore off our coastline. So that's part of the reason why it's very rare that even if one does die and come to the surface, um, they're pretty much eaten by gulls and everything else or yeah. will just sink again by the time they get to shore. 
Yeah, and uh, just uh, you mentioned that they don't often get caught by trawlers because they're, they're not in that area. Do trawlers only go to like less than 200 metres deep? Oh, absolutely not. No, the orange roughy trawl fishery, for example, is operating out in, you know, over a thousand metres of water at times, but they're fishing on the bottom or very, very close to the bottom. So they're not fishing the kind of areas that this kind of species is found in, which is a much more open ocean mid-water area. So the fish are pretty much uh, left to their own devices to happily feed on krill uh, and that kind of stuff, small crustaceans and not surprisingly, left alone, they can grow up to, up to 10 metres in length. So they're quite an amazing fish if you ever get to see one. Yeah, and speaking of which, <laughs> we do actually have an image of a uh, or an oar fish. Look at that. <laughs> that was uh, washed up on a beach in California. Uh, Neville, is that the biggest one you've seen? Oh, it's the biggest one I've seen in photos. I've never had the privilege of seeing one in real life. Again, because they... Um, uh, you know, extremely rare. I think um, someone mentioned one washed up in the Derwent about 10 years ago and uh, I actually had a message this afternoon from a gentleman who saw one snorkelling on the north coast of Tassie uh, 10, 10 or more years ago now. So they do occasionally come in, but it's again, it's extremely rare and I'd, I'd love to go and see it. But again, the west coast of Tassie is a long way away from where we are here in Hobart. Oh, it's not that one. It's a bit of a poor excuse. <laughs> <laughs> So is that a bit of a bucket list thing for you? You love to kind of come across an oar fish in the ocean? Oh, these kind of mysterious creatures are fantastic, yes. Yeah. I had the privilege of coming across a sunfish once and it's, you know, a di different kind of thing, but they're the same really large fish and they just float around eating similar kind of um, plankton in the ocean. So, again, kind of special to find these big oceanic fish. Um, Beasts, really? Yeah, they really do look quite mystical. And so, and what's the origin of the name Doomsday Fish? Well, I guess that's yeah, it's a bit of an old tale, I suppose, and a fable, in, in the sense that they they typically are, are seen sometimes in association with events like tsunamis and uh, and major earthquakes. Oh. And I, I think a lot of that comes from the area around places like Japan, where you can have very very um, uh, deep water quite near the shoreline so the kind of water that these things live in is quite close to the shore and and I guess the shock of a tsunami is enough to wash them up and yeah. out of their deep water and, and and wash them ashore so there's possibly a relationship between seeing them and, and that big event but but really it's the event that's caused the, the things to wash ashore rather than uh, anything else so there's no real relationship there. A dog walker in Tasmania has stumbled upon an elusive so-called doomsday fish washed up on Ocean Beach west of Strawn. The oarfish is an unusual looking creature from the deep that's rarely seen by humans and is the longest bony fish species in the world. Neville Barrett is a fish biologist and associate professor at the University of Tasmania and he joins us now from Hobart. Neville, g'day. So why is there such a buzz about this particular fish? Well, I guess it's just there. Yeah, it's just the rarity of it, really, um, or the rarity of seeing them. We, we seem to think they're probably reasonably common out there in the in the vast ocean, but they very unusually get washed ashore. And, and uh, it appears that one has not only washed ashore on the west coast of Tasmania in the last day or two, but it's in very, very good, con good condition. Yeah, so we're seeing some shots of it now. Yeah, and pretty colours uh, on parts of its body, aren't there? And this was just a woman walking, walking a dog along the beach. And uh, does the like the west coast of Tassie uh, pick up a few of these oarfish over the years, or is this quite rare? It's it's very very rare, but if it's going to wash up anywhere, it'll be on our wild west coast <laughs> where the winds and the swirls bring them in because they live in the, in the open ocean in mid water, um, and even if one dies and comes to the surface, it'll only be up there for a while before it sinks again. Um, and so on our west coast, we've got this, you know, very strong onshore winds a lot of the time and they, they tend to occasionally blow these mysterious kinds of creatures ashore, which is uh, fantastic. A 175 centimetre long doomsday fish just washed up on an Aussie beach and some believe it's a bad omen. The oarfish is a deep sea creature that usually lives up to 1,000 metres below the surface. Many people believe the so-called doomsday fish is linked to natural disasters like earthquakes. There has long been speculation that the deep sea species could be brought to the surface during underwater tremors, although this has not been scientifically proven. Associations between oarfish and earthquakes date back to 17th century Japan and were renewed 
continued in 2011 after 20 were spotted ahead of the earthquake that sparked the Fukushima nuclear disaster. However, there is no scientific evidence that the two are connected. What do you think? Welcome back. A deadly magnitude 5.8 earthquake struck southwestern Turkey this morning and the terrifying moments were caught on camera. A 14-year-old girl had a panic attack and died. Around 70 other people were injured as they rushed to find safety. The quake was also felt in Greece and as far away as Egypt. Well, the rumbling wasn't that intense, but a teen died and dozens more were injured when a 5.8 magnitude earthquake hit a coastal town in southern Turkey. The teen who died was rushed to the hospital after reportedly experiencing an anxiety attack. Most of the people were hurt, injured, jumping from windows or balconies to get out of their homes. So far, there have been no reports of damage to buildings. Mm. Well, a news anchor cuts an interview short as a 6.2 earthquake begins to shake the anchor desk and violent. Like, that set. She addresses the camera telling everyone to stay calm and to please call her mother. Uh, the quake lasted about 13 seconds. Istanbul sits on two major fault lines and is one of the most seismically active regions in the world. Of course, I'm just trying to watch the video there. No deaths were reported, but there were injuries after many people jumped buildings due to panic. It's one of the largest supervolcanoes in the country, and recent work out of the University of New Mexico led to a breakthrough discovery that could help geoscientists better predict an eruption and save lives. News 13's Bello Olage reports. So it's very satisfying to see that come to fruition. Tobias Fischer is a distinguished professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of New Mexico, and he's teamed up with a colleague to investigate Yellowstone National Park's volcanic system. Professor Brandon Schmant is really the person who started this project. He's a geophysicist and he wanted to investigate the composition of the magma and where the magma is under Yellowstone and especially how much volatiles are in the magma right now. Fisher says Yellowstone's last volcanic eruption was about 70,000 years ago and there's still an entire system sitting below the park today. Last August, KRQE reported on a localized hydrothermal explosion that happened at the National Park. So the hydrothermal system has all these beautiful geysers and hot springs and mud pots that attract millions of people a year to see the park and see these features. The team's study led them to look at earthquakes they produced themselves with a big thumper truck. With that detailed geophysical study, they can make a very nice CAT scan, essentially, of what's under Yellowstone. And they discovered that there is a really gas-rich, volatile-rich cap on top of the magma chamber. Fisher says when volcanoes erupt, they're driven by new magma coming into the system. They use samples from Yellowstone on this machine to learn more. As magma rises towards the surface, gases like water and CO2 exhaust from that magma at shallower levels. Those gases migrate up to the surface and then eventually accumulate at some depth. The group found exactly where that accumulation happens, allowing them a better picture at what's taking place right under our feet. So it's a very detailed image of the quantity of water, the quantities of pores, the quantities of magma, and where exactly it sits under Yellowstone, how big it is. Bella Olage, KRQE, News 13. Fisher says that you know, the Yellowstone system is similar to the Valles Caldera here in New Mexico. Although Valles Caldera is smaller, it's a supervolcano that's produced large eruptions roughly a million years ago. Tourists in a pool in Sicily apparently ignoring the plumes of smoke coming from a Mount Etna, one of the world's most active volcanoes. Plumes of smoke started early Monday morning after Italy's National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology started clocking tremors Sunday night. The group reporting that the volcano has been going through, quote, explosions of growing intensity in recent weeks with frequent and powerful eruptions all May. Around the world, we're seeing some breathtaking images here of this mesmerizing eruption in Italy. Check out this. This is as Mount Etna is erupting. The footage showing smoke rising from that crater there. 
the westernmost summit crater. Its form was formed in 1968 as a small pit crater on the summit crater cone. The last major eruption of this crater was back in 1999. This latest eruption is considered small and non-explosive. Mount Etna in Italy has put on a dazzling fiery display. Fountains of lava roared into the air from the southeast crater, while glowing ash clouds drifted over the night sky. Activity intensified at Europe's most active volcano earlier this year. The powerful eruption marks the 13th for 2025. Italy's Mount Etna volcano erupted yesterday. You can see all of the smoke plumes filling the sky, billowing out, sending everybody nearby, scrambling to get away. What a sight there, certainly. They had to um, cancel the flights by the airport there in Sicily. Mount Etna, of course, is one of the most active volcanoes in the world, and it usually erupts a few times a year, including several times just last month, but this one was spectacular. It's a spectacular sight, and it had tourists on the hop. Mount Etna erupting in dramatic fashion, the world's most active volcano putting on quite the show. The start of summer in Sicily, marked by an almighty eruption. Tourists fleeing down Mount Etna, racing against cascading gas and an avalanche of ash and rock. One of the world's most active volcanoes putting on its biggest show in more than a decade. The eruption began around 11.30 in the morning. A red alert briefly put in place for flights, but local airports continued to operate as the volcanic cloud shot an estimated six and a half kilometres into the air. Scientists suggesting Mount Etna's display was triggered by a partial collapse of the southeast crater which has produced spectacular lava flows in recent months. Authorities say there was no immediate danger, with no debris reaching tourists, who will now be going home with quite the travel story. This is one of the larger eruptions it's had in the last decade or so. This tower of smoke more than 20,000 feet tall and visible for miles in every direction. And once darkness falls, spurts of lava spectacularly visible. This thermal camera showing lava pouring down the mountainside. Among those to witness Etna's power, Keith and Kristen Nicewender from outside Philadelphia. It was hundreds of feet in the air. It looked like an atomic bomb had gone off. It was really the most amazing thing I've ever seen. What did you think when you saw it? Oh, yeah, I, at first I thought it was so surreal that it wasn't happening, and then it registered. The couple came to Sicily to trace Kristen's family tree and ended up encountering the same volcano her ancestors would have seen. So I guess the Sicilians call her the Mother Mountain, Mother Etna. Mm -hmm. And she they, was, she was getting angry. <laughs> she was getting angry. Mother Etna has been erupting for thousands of years. Its ancient power, an occasional challenge to modern living in Sicily. The last major eruption in 2024, forcing a one day closure of the island's main airport part of life in the shadow of the volcano.